Thank you so much for having a chat to me. It's an honour to be speaking with you today. I absolutely Very adore reciprocal your honor. work. <laughs> I love your little vignettes of uh, of life by the foreshore in Nice. So, photography, where did that all start? How did you develop the passion for photography? Well, actually, it has been an on and off course, actually. I first started photography when I went to India mm. as an adolescent, and actually my elder brother uh briefly introduced me I think it was something like 30 minutes sitting on his bed and he you know throws the camera into my hand and said okay so this is you know depth of field and speed and <laughs> and uh aperture and this is how you do it and um I took the camera it was a Canon A1 yeah and uh, it actually helped me survive the the shock of being a well you know it German middle class girl arriving in India yeah. in what was then Bombay and so that was my first experience, which was a very emotional one of, you know, having the camera uh, helping me to harness um, the experience of seeing something so very different of myself. Well, and then actually, I, I mean, I let it go and it was on and off. Uh, when I had my boys, it became an extremely private uh, exploration of them growing up. And uh, once they left home as grown ups, I came back to photography. Do you still have those photos from India? I think those were slides, extra uh, ah. ectachrome 64 slides. They must still be somewhere, yes. Fantastic. And uh, I read that you've got a background in anthropology. So how do you think, yes, I, how do you, would you say that that's informed your photography at all? Or? Well, I think actually they, they, they stem from the same source. Yeah. It's it's interest in people and surroundings and in this passion of trying to make sense. Why are people what they are doing and how do people fit um, into the environment and what is the underlying pattern. So I actually think both activities come from the same basic fascination for that. Let's jump straight into your work. This photo here, I absolutely love it. Uh, tell us the story behind this. I love the dog and uh, its expression. It looks like it's in a fashion shoot or, or in a car commercial or something. It's absolutely adorable. Yep, thank you. Well, this was this is one of those sheer luck moments in of... Um, Sometimes you make the best photos when you're not looking or yeah. when you're not trying to make one. I actually came back, was coming home from a, an afternoon now trying to shoot and I was, you know, putting the camera away. This is very close to where I live. And then I saw the scene and I actually took up the camera as it was with the settings. I didn't do anything else than just concentrating on connecting with the dark for that split second. Yeah. And um that is actually what had happened. So what I learned from this one is sometimes it's having, you know, your mind totally unfocused, which might yeah. be the trick of running into something. Now, this one's an absolute cracker. Tell us about this. It's obviously not on the foreshore of Nice, but it's, um, is this in Nice itself? And uh, where did you get this shot? Well, it's actually very close to the other one. This is a tram station. This okay. is a tram station. This is the the, the final stop of our new tram line running from the port to the airport. This is on the port side. And it was in on an early morning in September and I was actually going going out for work and um, had my camera with me. And I saw this green blur from, <laughs> from a distance, yeah. you know, and I said, oh, what is this thing? I couldn't really see it. And um, so I actually got the camera ready because there was something green and normally I don't have green in my photography. Mm. And I had, just been criticized for constantly shooting blue and that's why there was something green so <laughs> I actually moved towards that quite quickly and I just sort of couldn't believe my eyes 
and uh, I shot this. And um, the girl was actually trying to make soap bubbles, but it, you can't really see it. You know, she yeah. photo isn't perfect, and uh, she was she was, so there was a virus blowing soap bubbles. And so I was so intrigued that I approached her afterwards. And um, it was actually back to school fun by medical students when they have some, we call it bizutage here, is when the newcomers have to do sometimes more or less ridiculous things to get into the inner circuits of the already established students. And what was most fascinating for me actually wasn't the virus, but was this totally uninterested man sitting mm. on the other side. Like it was the most normal thing, you know, sitting next to a giant virus in 2021. Yeah, I mean, it's it's almost the quintessential photo for our times, isn't it? You've got this uh, virus lurking, sitting on the end and, uh, you know, social distancing, but someone ig- ignore it. Did he ever acknowledge her existence or he just kept carrying on reading his newspaper? <laughs> Well, actually, the, the man was totally uninterested. Actually, since I had been talking to the young girl, it was actually stepped for him too, but he couldn't couldn't be bothered. Actually, yeah. so uh, I sent the photo to the girl, and uh, but I, I don't know who the man was. He, I think, he was far more interested in the real news than, you know, having this camera <laughs> and virus thing around. Around, yeah. Well, look, when I look at your work, um, there's a real depth of storytelling and it's almost sort of novelistic in a way. Are, are you sort of working on a project or, wh- or where do you think it goes? Are you going to make a book or wh- what do you have in mind for your work? Um, I actually don't have, well, right now what I would like to do is um, getting into the innards of the old knees because we still have beautiful craftsmen and women out there. We've got a hat maker, we've got a shoemaker, We've got the rib butchers. We've got um, many people still, you know, going around their business being mm. craft. And I would like to have, you know, their photos in their environment to have a record of it before it unfortunately might disappear. Yeah. But before I hadn't actually been working on a project, I'd just been walking around the promenade because I live really nearby and it was the the, the easy getaway and mm-hmm. I actually have a two-time relationship with Nice because my boys grew up here but it was a single mom mm-hmm. so during those years I strictly had no time for something as superficial as just walking around with a camera when I had when I was on the street I had to go from A to B yeah. and I had to do it quickly and a street was good if it allowed me to go quickly from A to B And so I had no interest in the promenade because the promenade, if you're driving, is a constant traffic jam. Mm. So I normally try to avoid it. And when people talked about the promenade saying it was something special, I just couldn't understand it. And uh, when I came back to Nice after having lived in northern France for some time, Mm. uh, it was a totally different thing. And so actually it was my first photography of Nice or everything you're seeing now is actually coming to terms with the city and seeing the beauty of it, which had sort of been escaping me for years. Mm. Well, no, you've, you've definitely captured the beauty of it. And tell me about going back to the same scene every sort of, I don't know if you, how often you photograph, whether it's every day or a couple of times a week, but you're always getting these different stories, different sort of vignettes of, of life near those chairs on the, uh, on the foreshore. And uh, it looks it's not something I do. I sort of, uh, you know, shoot a scene and I think I'm done with it, which is probably not the right approach. But how do you go going to the same scene all the time and finding those different stories? Well, I think actually, I think it, it's different things coming together. First of all, it, it's close by. Mm. Um, so I just have to go out and go along. And as Adrian, Adrian Ware often says, well, if I don't get a nice photo, at least I had a nice walk. Yeah. And I actually followed the same philosophy without knowing he had the same at that time. So it's actually soothing looking over the sea. And looking over the sea, I saw it came out as a blank canvas against which the scenes were set. So aesthetically speaking, there was that reason. So you have this blank canvas of the sky or of the sea, and you don't have any disturbing elements. Mm -hmm. Um, Then we have a a very strict uh, law in France when it comes to um, shooting people. You're not allowed normally to take people's photographs without their consent if they are identifiable. Right. So actually taking them from the back played beautiful into this. And then it's a place in which I am truly connected with myself. It sounds a little bit mystical, 
but it is like I feel I've got I'm legitimate mm. being there and I'm legitimate documenting it because I understand what's going on. Um so on that actually opened my mind to really seeing the details and then afterwards came this interest for small gestures or postures as being as as being the quintessential part of a story. Mm. And right now I'm wondering if I have a bit of aesthetic or creative Stockholm syndrome. <laughs> so we'll go, uh, going there and um, well, yeah, see, so it's not only one reason, it's several reasons playing together, but this yeah. is how it comes. And um, this, this feeling of being legitimate is really something that um, is something I'm struggling with. I went to Istanbul on a wonderful trip in, in October and I took lots of photos and I haven't posted them yet because mm. I'm not sure I really understand what I took. Right, okay, that's interesting. So, and you'd be somewhat of a local legend, I guess, in Nice now. Do people are like, oh, here's the camera lady again, or? Uh, well, no, yeah, I mean, there's some, several of us. Well, in the old town, yes, because actually yeah. I really try to function local in the sense of doing my shopping in my um, neighborhood and getting ahead from the hat maker and getting my shoes repaired from the shoemaker. Um, and so you actually start chatting and i often have my camera with me and and so they see the camera and this is how it starts uh, yes I, but i wouldn't say legend no really basic question sorry are, are those chairs there all the time or does someone come out and put them out every day or had i've always sort of wondered i don't know why <laughs> well actually no those blue chairs normally are permanently there they were just taken away during i don't know if it was the first or the second lockdown getting lost in the lockdowns yeah well they actually rifted together so you can't take them away they come as a whole line and okay. you can only move the entire line yeah so um they go back a long way they've been there for for more than 100 years for about 100 years not more than 100 years because they were then 30s and they were white and wooden at that time and you could you know, move them around. And then they move to blue and to the specific design. Uh, sometimes the entire line is a little bit set back to get people away from waves. If the sea is getting a bit stormy, but that doesn't happen often with the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. And you actually have a certain stretch of the promenade where you have the blue chairs. And then at some point they stop. And then you have white benches. Right. So you see it's... Um, it's also a marker where the more touristic area is supposed to be, I think. Well, uh, I have been to Nice, but I was a much younger man, and it I just remember it rained the whole time, so I'll have to go back. <laughs> <laughs> that was really not very lucky. <laughs> well, um, look, again, thanks so much for chatting to me. Really appreciate it. You're and, very um, welcome. I'll, uh, I'll look forward to uh, following your work down here from Australia. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank it was you. a pleasure talking to you. Okay, bye-bye.